Last week, we finished talking about the main filmmaking elements. So starting this week, we will talk about some of the themes commonly seen in films. Now, when we talk about themes, uh, we're mostly talking about the story of films. But we can also think about how the filmmaking elements help to develop those themes. Uh, how the ex experience of watching a movie is different from the experience of reading a book or hearing someone tell you a story. This week's theme is technology. We've been talking a lot about how uh, technology is part of filmmaking and how the advance of technology has advanced uh, possible filmmaking techniques, especially last week when we talked about special effects. But today I want to think about technology within the story of the film or within the world of the film. And if you really think about it, when we talk about the story world of a film, most of the time it's the same world as we live in today. The difference between the world in a story and the world as we live it is that you know that the world of a story is created and designed for a, some kind of purpose. A filmmaker or a storyteller always has something that they want to tell their audience and how they create that world helps them to tell that story. So it's not as unlimited a world as we live in. It's a more limited, designed, intentional world. And yet, whether it's in the real world or in a story world, when we talk about technology, we're usually talking about technological change. So it doesn't really matter the specific technology that a character uses. What matters is how technology changes over time uh, and how those changes change human experience. We can think about technological change, the effects of technological change from three perspectives, time, space, and knowledge. Uh, the most impactful technological changes have to do with transportation, uh, moving from walking on foot to riding horses to driving cars, boats, planes, railroads. With each development in transportation technology, people have to spend less and less time on traveling. And therefore, they can spend more time on other things. These other things are usually what are important for a story. So, for example, if you watch a historical drama, uh, often a lot of time in the story will be spent on traveling. Or maybe the, the film will skip over the traveling part, but it will tell you it took this character six months to get from A to B. But if you need to spend less time traveling, you can spend more time doing other things. Now, the flip side of this is that uh, because technology advances not for one person only, but for groups of people or even societies of people at a time, when one person can save time on transportation, that means a whole group or whole society of people can save time on transportation. So relatively speaking, the free time or extra time that each person gets is not more than the, that of the other people in their community. In other words, when technology advances and we have more time on our hands, we also tend to have more things that we have to do. Uh, you may have heard people arguing that uh, we need to work less or like we need to spend less time working so that we can have more free time to do other things. But usually what these people don't say is that we used to work a lot more. Uh, when 
the Industrial Revolution first happened, people worked six days a week, often for 12 or 15 hours a day. And yet even today when the standard workday is eight hours and for five days a week, uh, we still feel like there's so much to do and uh, there's often not enough time to, to do it. And this is because even though we have begun working less, everybody works less together. So everybody expects there for to have more time, including your bosses and your teachers also expect you to have a weekend or like evenings after class. And so the things that your bosses and teachers ask you to do have also increased along with your free time. So what we see in films, therefore, is that the more modern the film is, or the more modern the setting of the film, the more things that the characters have to do. If you watch a historical drama, uh, usually the plot will advance very slowly in terms of the time of the world, because back then most of your time was spent either traveling or on housework or on cooking and cleaning or on farming. And only after you have finished all of that, when you have leftover time, can something special happen. And that something special will usually be the story of the film. So uh, uh, a film set long ago may take place over months, over years, even over decades, but it will still feel like it's a standard amount of story. Whereas if you watch a contemporary story, some of the most exciting uh, action-packed stories take place over two days, three days. There's even movies that take place over an hour uh, and the entire hour is filled with things happening and going on. And that is mostly because of the change of technology and the effects of those changes on time, how we experience and use time. The second aspect is space. Time and space are, of course, connected. Uh, if you have more time, if, if you can save time on traveling, that means that in the same amount of time you can go further. So again, whereas uh, in the past, if you wanted uh, some some uh, stories set in the past are entirely about crossing an ocean. That's the story. Where are they going? How? How uh, much effort does it take and do they make it? Whereas today, uh, a simple shot of an airplane is enough to tell the audience, oh, we're going somewhere far away. Uh, so this means that uh, stories set closer to the modern day can cover more ground. It doesn't have to take place in the same town. It doesn't have to take place in the same country. And that's why we have movies, especially action movies, right? where one scene a character says, oh, the bad guys are going to Asia, and then the next scene we're in Asia. We're like, oh, the bad guys are going to the South Pole, and then the next scene they're going to the South Pole. Uh, and that's because we have accepted that technology has advanced enough for people who have enough money to travel wherever they want around the world. Um, there's, even a, <laughs> there's even a rumor that Tom Cruise is next going to make a movie that's not just set in space, but that he's actually going to go to space to make the movie. Not sure if that's true, but because of how technology has advanced so far, it doesn't sound impossible. It sounds crazy, but it, like doable. It could be true. Um, so if you have stories that span broad amounts of space where characters travel through many places, one effect is you start to feel the impact of each place less. Each place feels less important. It's just another place. If you watch old movies that are set like in one town, you start to get a feeling for this town. You know where the locations are related to each other. You know what each location feels like. You get to know the shop owners. You get to know the doctor, the lawyer. But if your story covers large amounts of space, uh, then as a filmmaker, you, you simply need to point out, 
oh, this is New York or, oh, this is Paris. And there's really not much more that you can do because you're not spending your whole film here. This is just one stop. And so instead of creating a space in the film, uh, these modern globe trotting movies refer to a space or refer to a place and depend on the audience to fill in knowledge about that place or fill in emotions about that place. For example, uh, New York is the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps, the capital of the world. Paris is the city of love, romance. Rome, okay, maybe not Rome. Milan is the city of fashion, right? So you don't have to create those worlds in the film. You simply point out this is where we are and the audience will supply that information. Uh, because the film is usually still under two hours. You can't really spend so much time on so many different places. This also means that there has been a gradual decline in a traditional form of story, which is the story of movement going from one place to another place. For example, moving house or going on a journey. If your story takes place in the modern day, uh, filmmakers now have to add obstacles or add reasons why this could be difficult. Uh, with modern technology, if you need to move house, you simply call someone, travel over, find a new place, hire some movers, and then move house. So if you want to make a story out of it, first you have to like create some kind of intimate connection between the characters and their original place. Therefore, when they leave that place, there will be some emotional conflict. Or you might want to portray the new place as strange and unwelcoming and hostile, so that when they go to the new place, there will be some problems there. But simply telling the story of moving house is no longer uh, a common story. Whereas in the past, since technology was not yet so advanced, movement was more difficult. Uh, for example, a story set in the United States. If someone moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, that itself could be a story. And usually that story is a Western, Xi Bu Pian. So that's another way that technology has affected the world of the film in how it allows us to have more locations and broader space, but has uh, dampened our emotional attachment to each of those spaces. The third aspect of technological advance I want to talk about is knowledge. Uh, I'm going to say something that might surprise you. Advancing technology has reduced our knowledge we now have less knowledge than we used to. We have more information, but we remember less of it. Less of it is within our minds whenever we need it. Uh, because now it's all online. If you can't remember something, Google. If you need to know something immediately, Google. If you need to contact someone and ask them for information, line. It's immediate. Therefore, we need to remember less information and therefore we have less knowledge. Uh, in a film, the, we, this is one of the most uh, obvious effects of technological advance because knowledge and information are one of the key points of a story. Does a character know what they need to know? If they don't, how do they find out? Once they find out, how does it change them? How does it change the story? When information is so easy to access, uh, the traditional stories, for example, like four kids in the suburbs discover something they don't know about and they don't want to tell their parents, so they use all sorts of wacky ways to figure out what this is. No longer works because now kids all have cell phones or they all know somebody with a cell phone or they have access to a computer with the internet. 
so the information plot is no longer very prevalent today. Or think about how a film delivers information to the audience. We've talked about how sometimes information is given to the audience uh, or information is presented in the film, not because the characters need to tell each other. The characters all know what's going on. It's presented in the film so that the audience knows what's going on. This is called exposition. So in the past, it's more likely to have two characters have a conversation where one person is actually informing the other person of what's going on because people didn't know everything all at once. Uh, later, as uh, communication technology advanced, information traveled faster, and then there it was invented something called the answering machine, da lu ji, or liu shen ji. Uh, this was especially good for filmmaking because what is an answering machine? An answering machine is a machine that records phone calls that you miss. Why would someone call you? Because they either want to tell you something or they want to ask you for something. So in, especially in the 90s, 80s and 90s, when a character walks into their living room and plays the answering machine, everything they hear is new information for the character, but it's also important information for the audience. These are the people in the character's life. These are the people who want to help the character or want to hurt the character. There's some kind of relationship there. Uh, and so when the answering machine was popular, all you needed was five minutes and the audience would know exactly who this person is and exactly what they uh, should be expecting in this movie. But today, uh, contemporary culture is actually a textual culture. Most of us make, uh, most of us send more texts and emails than we take phone calls. Or like we scroll social media, which is all written mostly. So the problem then becomes, how do you present written communication in a movie, which is a visual medium uh, or like it's a medium where where things are performed and presented to you. And there have been a number of attempts to get this right. For example, uh, Sherlock, the TV show starring Benedict Cumberbatch, is famous for putting his text messages and phone information on the screen. And that worked for a while, uh, but Turns out audiences don't really like to read their read a character's phone during a movie. Uh, so other attempts have been tried, such as like having a narrator read the information to the audience. But that doesn't feel very real. Um, there have also been movies that have been set entirely on digital screens. For example, the movie Searching is about a father whose daughter is kidnapped and the entire story is told through digital screens, whether it's computer screens or phone screens or TV screens. Um, and the only way that we see the actor is through a webcam uh, when they also appear on the screen. Uh, but that has its own problems, right? When we're using a digital screen, a lot of the time is wasted time. We're scrolling, we're clicking and waiting. Um, another problem is we're not always paying attention to the entire screen at the same time. And yet uh, that would mean that the camera also has to follow where we are following. Uh, there's also another problem with that particular movie, which is uh, one part of the story, the father tries to find out what's been going on in his daughter's life, so he logs into her email account but he doesn't know her password and he is not the backup uh, account for that account. So like, how does he get into her email? The film skips over that detail. Uh, so there are still problems with uh, directly portraying uh, the digital world on screen. Um, but these are problems of having too much information and not knowing how to put them in the correct storytelling order uh, not knowing how to uh, 
select the important parts and leave out the unimportant parts. When you watch an older story, uh, the, for example, before the invention of the telephone, basically the only kind of long form, uh, long distance communication is the letter. So you don't have this problem. There's only one letter. It's only that long, so you might as well show the entire letter. Uh, at the same time, letters, because they are so uh, seldom, you don't get many of them. So each letter becomes more important. So you have stories of like long distance lovers who live in two places and they only write letters, love letters. And so you have the characters examining each word or even each stroke of the pen or like kissing the seal of the letter because it is where uh, their beloved uh, has sealed the letter with their own mouth as this kind of indirect kissing, things like that. But like these are things that you lose in a digital communications environment. Uh, even back when using uh, voice calls, like actually calling people was the most common means of communication, you had the sound of the voice. You could split the screen in two halves and show the conversation as if it were happening in the same room. Uh, so today I think the biggest issue for dealing with technology in the story world of a film is how to handle digital technology and digital communication. Uh, of course, there's always uh, you can just cop out, right? You can not deal with it. You can create a world where for some strange reason, all of the characters uh, don't have phones. Or like uh, you simply portray characters who don't use their phones until suddenly they the story needs them to have urgent information. Uh, but as the Internet and cell phones grow more uh, expected like as if it's always been a part of our lives movies where characters don't use their phones very often will feel more and more unreal uh, less and less like they live in the world that we live in so this is a problem that filmmakers have to figure out how to deal with i don't know the answer i'm not a filmmaker uh but that's something that we can uh, look forward to and pay attention to in the future. Uh, so with the growing access to information, uh, people ha have also changed in their expectations of information. In the past, if you had a question and it, the answer was not in a dictionary, was not in an encyclopedia, you basically had two choices. One, you can call your local library. Uh, libraries have something called a reference desk. Uh, and the person sitting at the reference desk is supposed to be able to answer any question you have and give you any information that the library has. And if they didn't know, your second option is just to forget it. Not that important. If you can keep going on with your life without that information, it's not that important. Whereas today, when you're simply chatting with your friend and you can't remember the name of that movie with that actor who did that, that, and you can go online and look for it right away. That change in expectation uh, has changed a lot about how people interact and what they expect from the world around them and from society around them. The space of the unknown has been shrinking. And in many ways, I think that's one reason why horror films have become more and more popular. Uh, but before we talk about horror films, do you have questions about technology in film? OK, so today we're watching a movie called Personal Shopper. It's technically a horror film, but it's not uh, very scary a lot of the time. So sometimes it is very scary, uh, but more often it's simply tense. Or we might say uh, unsettling, disquieting. And this is because when we talk about horror films, horror films don't have to be scary. 
Did you know that? The idea of a horror film is not something that scares you. A horror film is something that makes you feel uneasy, makes you feel like something is wrong, something bad might happen. This is not normal. This is not what life is supposed to be like. There's some kind of danger or something that you want to stay away from. That's what horror is about. So yes, the most common kind of uh, horror is the kind that scares you because nobody really likes to be scared all the time. Uh, so people naturally want to stay away from things that are scary. But you also have horror that is more disgusting, like body horror, the kind of movie where someone's leg gets chopped off or something gets stuck into their throat, something like that. Uh, you also have horror that deals uh, with uh, more fantasy kinds of things. So like Twilight is also considered horror because they're vampires and uh, like they're a question of like whether Bella wants to become a vampire for the rest of her life uh, or not. And the effects of like killing vampires and, and vampires sucking people's blood, things like that. So with this broader definition of horror, you get subgenres, not just scary horror, also comedy horror or uh, romantic horror or historical horror. Uh, films that use horror elements, but they tell a not so scary kind of story. One example of a comedy horror is uh, Zombieland, Jiang Siliren deals with zombies, lots of blood, lots of violence, but it's basically a funny movie. Um, so when we think about uh, the long tradition of horror films like this, we start to see common elements. What are the things that people are scared of or they want to stay away from? The biggest one, of course, is death. Anything that can kill you uh, could be a part of a horror movie but also unexpected death. If your death is coming and you know when it's going to arrive, it's not that scary. Uh, it's still scary, right? Because you can't avoid it, but uh, it's scarier and is more troubling when you know that you're going to die soon, but you don't know exactly when. So for example, Final Destination, that kind of movie, death is, near, but you don't know exactly when. You also have uh, horror movies about t uh, bad experiences that are related to death, but not exactly dying. So suffering, like uh, the Saw movies, Duo Hun Ju, or uh, experiences that are n not scary because you're going to die, but scary because of the experience itself. It's a disgusting experience. It's an experience nobody would ever want to go through. For example, uh, the human centipede. Um, and then if you move into in the, uh, even more broad horror territory, you have movies that are not actually giving you this feeling, but are using the elements that would give you this feeling to make another kind of movie. So for example, uh, you have action horror, where, for example, in the movie, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, uh, the story is historical figure, Abraham Lincoln is fighting the American South, but the American South is actually controlled by vampires. So when the soldiers fight the Civil War, it's not two human sides fighting, it's one human side fighting against an army of vampires and vi vampires can kill you in many different ways, and it's very disgusting. But at its core, it's not scary. It's action with a lot of horror elements. Uh, horror comedy is also the same. There are lots of horror elements, but it's used to tell a funny story instead of a scary one. For example, there's a very small movie called Dave Made a Maze. And the story is this guy, Dave, built a maze out of paper and cardboard. And for some reason, the maze is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And apparently there inside the maze, he created traps and monsters and like evil stuff. 
and he got lost inside his own maze. So his friends have to go in and save him. Sounds kind of scary, but because everything is made out of paper, when you see like a monster, it's a paper monster. It's not that scary. Um, but because the elements are traditionally from horror movies, uh, the situations of that story are also from horror movies. Um, it's simply not scary because everything is made of paper. So, and in fact, there are some jokes as well. So it's a comedy horror. But at its core, what unites all of these different kinds of horror films and what makes things scary is fear of the unknown things that we are not prepared for, things that we do not understand. If you think about it, right? Unexpected death. We don't know when it's going to happen. Zombies, vampires, and ghosts. We don't understand them. We've never seen them. They are from a different kind of world. We, we can't really communicate with them. We don't know what to expect from them. Animal horror, where like uh, you get chased by a, a monster or like a group of man-eating fish or something. Uh, Blake Lively became famous for doing a movie called The Shallows, where she's almost killed by a, a school of piranha, Uh Animals, we can't really communicate with them. We don't know whether they want to eat us or they want to leave us alone. So at its core, we can say that horror is about fear of what we cannot understand and what we cannot control. So that ties back to the technology issue. With the advancement of technology, there is less and less that we do not understand. There is less and less that we cannot find out using the Internet. And so horror has become less and less about real things and more and more about fantasy and symbolism. And we'll talk about symbolism, I think, next week. But the idea is, in much of modern horror, the scary part is not the thing itself. The scary part is the idea of the thing uh, or how that thing does not fit into uh, our understanding of life, of daily life, of human life, of possible life. Sometimes, of course, uh, this thing is a person and that's where you get psychological horror. Every person is a mystery. You never can truly know any person. So every person is a possible killer and a possible monster. But they all look like ordinary people. And that is the part that we don't understand. That is the part we cannot control. Yeah, so to conclude, horror doesn't have to be scary, but it usually deals with something either we cannot know or cannot understand, and that gives us a, a troubling feeling, an unsettling, disruptive, disgusting feeling, even if it's not the main feeling of the film. Questions? Uh, okay, a uh, quick announcement. Uh, we're talking about horror this week, but actually the really scary movie, the one that's scary from beginning to end, will come next week when we talk about historical dramas. Uh, so this week we're watching Personal Shopper. Uh, this is a special film for our class because it's the first time we're going to watch a movie with the same director and the same star as another film that we watched. Uh, in, I think, week four, we watched Clouds of Sils Maria, the story about acting. Uh, two actors in the Swiss mountains preparing for a play. That film was directed by a French director named uh, Olivier Assayas, starring Juliette Binoche and Kristen Stewart. Uh, so at the time, the director didn't really know Kristen Stewart. All he knew was that this girl just finished filming uh, Twilight. She seems interesting. She doesn't seem like she seems like she can do much more than just Twilight. Uh, so he cast her in that movie and had her talk about like art films, popular films, different kinds of acting. And it was a quite interesting result. 
But then he realized that she could do much more, this Kristen Stewart person. And so the next film he made, he cast her specifically in the lead role. And it's a movie that uh, shows the many different sides of Kristen as an actor, where she can deal with many different situations, all while portraying the same kind of melancholy, uh, desperate, hopeless character in the middle. Uh, so that's Personal Shopper, the movie we're going to watch this week. What is a personal shopper, first of all? A personal shopper is someone that a rich and famous person hires to shop for them, either because they're too busy to shop for themselves or because they're too famous and whenever they go out, they get surrounded by camera uh, people and paparazzi and fans, and so they can't really shop. So uh, they hire a personal shopper who either uh, is very clear about the size and body shape of the famous person, or they themselves physically resemble the famous person so they can try on clothes for that person. Uh, so really, a personal shopper is someone who whose job is to be another person, to represent another person, uh, not just in terms of the physical uh, appearance, but also in the ideas of taste and fashion, to know what this other person would want to wear or to know what they would like to look like. Uh, so in this movie, Kristen Stewart plays a personal shopper. Uh, but that's just her day job. She has something else going on throughout the movie as well. OK, so uh, if you don't have questions, let's take a 10 minute break and when we come back, we'll watch the movie. <laughs> 